one of the things that um, I would like us to maybe speculate about is the uh, way that art, mind, brain, and culture dealt with the collapse of Europe. Uh, this major shift in art making from gorgeous, beautiful, exploratory, you know, in some ways weaving knowledge together, and then, you know, f f from the explosion of culture and the diversity in art that followed, um, both as a scientist and, and uh, you know, a man interested in culture. Um, how have you sort of thought about this? Um, how oh, I think that's such a broad itself. question. It's really difficult for me to answer it. I can just give one example. And if you go upstairs at the museum now, you'll get a very good illustration of that. Um, the Austrian Expressionists are often seen in parallel with the German Expressionists. But in very simplified terms, I see them as being really radically different. Mm -hmm. um, the Austrian Expressionists, the Viennese modernists, as we discussed, we're really concerned with um, the life of the mind. Um, the German Expressionists were to a large degree concerned with a criticism of society and a criticism of going to war. Many of the leading artists, Kirchner, Beckmann, went uh, to war and went to war thinking it's going to rejuvenate mankind. This is what we need. We'll become a very bourgeois state society, and this is absolutely great that we have a chance to do this, to renew ourselves. And then when they got to the battlefront, they realized they're killing people there. This is not refreshing society. Some of them had nervous breakdowns. Um, and so a lot of uh, the work is typical of, of gross, tremendous criticism of how, you know, what purpose war serves and how society treats people you know, who are crippled, deformed by war. Um, so I think there you see an enormous critique of it. But I think many of the great artistic traditions, um, the insight into the human psyche, the movement into abstract art, 1911, 1912, now shown at the MoMA, the yeah. Leah Zuckerman, really, really extraordinary yeah, exhibition. Um, Cubism, I mean, this emerged before the war. Yeah. So a lot now, maybe there were premonitions that the society is in a really difficult period, and that probably was a key feature of it. This is one of the things that I sort of began to explore from um, typologies in aesthetics based on brain uh, network functions. Uh, I use terms like artist as amygdala or artist as hippocampus, where one of the things that a particular artist may be interested in is giving warnings about doom to come or archiving important things to, to um, put into long-term storage, you know, uh, that in some way what's going on in the brain in a single mind that art does in all of its diversities for culture, uh, almost as if art is a kind of uh, trace of the collective mind. Um, and in your, you know, uh, understanding the mechanisms between brain, mind, uh, art, and culture, um, I, I'm curious what your thoughts are about where we're going. Um, how, what we're trying to do right. now in well, the world. Well, I think what's happened is I think there's a general consensus within the scientific world that um, the great challenge for science in the 21st century is to understand the human mind in biological terms. And in terms of biology, the 19th century, particularly sort of 1950 to 1990, was the period of the gene. We're now moving into the period of the mind. Um, this is an enormous undertaking, much more complicated than gene or the genome, and we're just at the beginning. So uh, in terms of art, we're at a very early stage in understanding it. One of the reasons portraiture appeals to me as a starting point is that the area of the brain that represents faces is gigantic compared to other representations. So um, when you look at a computer, which can do enormous computations that you and I would never get close to doing, they have great difficulty with face recognitions that you and I do with enormous facilities. When people are young, they can distinguish between a thousand different faces, and yet, 
computers have great, great difficulty with it. And when we look at the brain, we see that there is, in fact, an area in the temporal cortex, in the inferior part of the temporal cortex, that is concerned with brain representation. And within those areas, there are patches in which you can record from cells. And this is uh, something Doris Tsao and Winifred Weinreich have shown, that single cells respond to faces. And you know this is so fascinating because as you have focused on uh, choosing to focus on faces for your, your uh, topic in art, and also this uh, step into abstraction where uh, we're moving away, but I think in some ways even abstract art uh, invites a kind of you almost look for the face in it. You know, you look for, oh, uh, the, you look for the mirror no, of no, yourself. There's no question that, well, two things. Expression is an abstract art. Let me just step back. As we talked before, <clears throat> um, when photography came along, the thrust of Western art to depict reality in progressively more effective terms was shattered because nothing could do this better than photographs. For a while, with Impressionism going outdoors and catching how the sunlight plays on surfaces was great, but that also ran dry of ideas after a while. So art moved in two directions, exaggeration of expression, Expressionism, or abstraction. With exaggeration of, of expression, we realized that the artist was intuitively tapping in to a special feature of the brain. The brain responds better to exaggerations to cartoons than a real face. If I were to have a cartoon of you, my cells would respond more powerfully. You recognize Nixon better from a cartoon than you do from a photograph, okay? The other direction was abstract art. And abstract art allows the creativity of the brain to run wild. Yeah. I mean, you look at a Rothko. I once sat in front of a Rothko and I said to myself, you think you're a reductionist? You're nothing. <laughs> This guy puts a bars of color and you see the world in there. You see spirituality. Yes. You see images you couldn't possibly conceive of when you first sat down. I, I, I will make a special trip to Houston to go to the Rothko Chapel. It's wonderful. Because you to walk in there, the first time I walked in the Rothko Chapel, it's a very dark chapel and you see these dark, at the end of his life as he became more depressed, he painted. Although Ed Reinhardt had done it before, he began to paint in, in essentially black, variants of black. You see nothing. And then after a while, you see some slight patches in these blacks. And then after a while, you feel movement. And you don't know where's the movement in your body. Is there. It's an amazing physical reaction. It's an amazing, e even amazing transcendent reaction. experience. Yeah. And yeah. you don't Rothko, have to do anything. Rothko Just is, sit is there amazing. and allow yeah. your brain yeah. Yeah. to respond to the yeah. context. Yeah. And speaking about interdisciplinary thing, um, there's a very interesting um, idea that emerges from the MoMA show. And that is that uh, Kadinsky, who is the first person to sort of break out in abstract art, was struggling and couldn't give up figuration. And then he heard Schoenberg's music. Oh my. And he said, wow, this guy, atonal, he's really left the traditional stuff behind. I've got to take the next step. And he did it. But simultaneously, you know, very soon thereafter, people from different countries began to converge in the same idea. Well, it, it seems that part of our nature, part of the, what this creative machine does is explore experiment and um, practice. Now, what is, what is that defined? That defines play. When children are practicing, interacting with the environment, they're experimenting, exploring, practicing, taking risks. And this is what Kids I are creative. Think artists and scientists do. We beat it out of them, but they're oh. creative to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> so th there's a wonderful book called The Scientist in the Crib. Uh, um, about um, a particularly phonemic learning and how wide uh, the, the net is that the brain can hear that, that culture uh, learns it smaller and smaller. So we actually lose capacity and we know that happens in the adolescent brain with pruning. Uh, now we, we see this happen in children. For example, a perfect example is um, a child can learn a foreign language extremely easily without any effort. So you could learn Chinese when you're three years old without any problem. After puberty, it's impossible to learn the language perfectly. You can learn the grammar, you can learn to speak it, but you cannot get the accent right. And I have a minimal accent, I'm told, except for a Brooklyn accent. My brother, 
who was four years old and never lost his accent. My wife, who came from Paris when she was 17 years old, still has a touch of her French accent. So you just can't lose that. And that holds for many aspects of life. When you're young, you can not only recognize a thousand different faces, you can recognize a thousand different faces of monkeys if you live in a monkey colony. Can you imagine monkeys? We think all monkeys look alike. That's because <laughs> we didn't live among monkeys when we grew up. So the, 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 uh, again, coming back to the notion that one of the functions artists do for keeping us together is leave traces of what our brain is doing all the time. Uh, it, it's as if, you know, the, the art is like glue for culture. And when cultures fall apart, artists shift the glue, move it to the right places, and things, and we get up and we kind of carry on. Um, I, I've often thought that, you know, uh, economic systems, religions, uh, social systems come and go, reorganize, but no culture doesn't make art or no culture stops making art, uh, which is why I think I became so obsessed with the, this notion that art is an imperative for human survival. I think an important thing to end with is that we have the outlines of a beholder share, different aspects of it, perception, empathy, uh, theory of mind, we have ideas of how those things occur, but it's at a very superficial level, and we need to get a much, much better understanding of it. What's also interesting is we're beginning to realize how modulatory systems of the brain play upon that. And this brings us back to the Bloch-Bauer. Um, you know, people have questioned why Ronald Lauder paid $135 million yes. for it. I've never had a moment's hesitation. Mm -hmm. Lauder saw this when he was a teenager, and he fell in love with it. He thought this was the epitome of feminine beauty of Vienna 1900, and he came back repeatedly to Vienna to see this. And he was dying to have it, and he couldn't have it. Now we know that when you enjoy something, a system in the brain concerned with pleasure, the dopaminergic system becomes active. If you're rejected in a love relationship, that system becomes even more active. So he's rejected repeatedly over all those years, but finally comes to he would have paid 155 million yeah. instead of 135 he million. He was addicted to it. He, he became obsessed and- With the idea of owning it. This is brilliant. See, now you're getting into an area that I hope maybe someday to talk to him or other collectors is the collector's mind. And, and I, I have that on an infinitely, infinitely <laughs> low scale. When Ernst Gombisch died, I turned on a program that Charlie Rose had done with him. And he said in that program, Charlie asked him, do you collect? Uh, and he said, no, I have some things for my parents, uh, but I myself do not collect. I get as much pleasure seeing a painting hanging in a museum or in a friend's house. And I said to myself, I wish I felt that way. On the modest scale in which Denise and I work, we are very eager to own yes. something that we really <laughs> like. Wonderful. That's a great note to stop on. Thank you again for coming. Oh, and pleasure. Uh, pleasure. It's been a great pleasure. pleasure.